the line. Hi everyone, welcome to the AJ Specification Materials and Focus series, supported by Mikkel Mersch and Van der Sanden. I'm Fran Williams, Technical Editor at the Architects Journal, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our first Materials and Focus discussion, focusing on the use of brick. Materials and Focus is a new series of AJ lunchtime webinars in which we will be exploring the use of materials in design and looking at how architects can specify these materials more sustainably. Each session will be dedicated to a specific material and will be chaired by a member of our AJ editorial team. These sessions stem from a series of material primers that we have been running in AJ specification over the last year or so, in which we have looked at various materials ranging from timber to insulation. Today's talk, however, will focus on brick. We have three architects joining us who will be sharing their projects and demonstrating their insight and experience on how they worked with the material. We are delighted to welcome as our speakers today, Michael Dillon, Associate at May Architects, Will Gamble, Director of Will Gamble Architects, and Alice Brownfield, Associate Director at Peter Barber Architects. Welcome all, and thank you for, for participating today. They will each talk for about 10 minutes, and then we will have a short panel discussion before we open up the discussion for your questions. You can submit your questions throughout the webinar by clicking on the Q&A function at the bottom of your screens. Before I introduce our first speaker, I would like to thank our supporters, Mikkel Mersch and Van der Sanden. Without their support, this event could not take place. So our huge thanks to them. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Michael Dillon, Associate at May. Thanks, Fran. I'll just try and share screen quickly. Is that working? Great. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'm today I'm talking about Sandsend Arts and Community Centre, um, which is a project that um, we started working on in 2017 with Hamilton from Fulham Council. Um, the project is located in South Park in Fulham, um, and it was a really interesting and curious site because it was located within a park within an existing um, Victorian wall boundary. Um, so it's a really interesting condition um, that sort of made us question what the building type would be that we'd propose for the community center. Um, the community center was replacing a, a community center that was taken down um, in the early 2000s, um, which was nearby in, in um, Wandsworth Bridge Road. Um, and so, it was looking at replacing a whole series of different um, community facilities. Um, so it had a really flexible brief. Um, the client wasn't completely sure about everything that needed to be accommodated in it. And so they wanted to ensure flexibility for the future. Um, what we found really interesting about the existing site is that up until the 1980s, um, the site was used as greenhouses for James Beach, who was one of the um, early horticulturists who bought in um, imported plants such as the orchids and the monkey puzzle tree, um, but really interesting structures that sit sat on site. Um, so a series of greenhouses and lean to structures. And this was sort of the starting point of the sort of building typologies we were considering for the site because it sat within a park. It was quite unique in that fact. So really interested in these sort of lean to structures. And these are some of the examples of of those that sat on site and also um, in the Royal Horticultural Society in, in Chelsea. Um, so the plan of the building was about creating an entrance to the park and an entrance to the street. Um, so you, there was a surrounding Victorian wall um, around Cloncarty Road and Peterborough Road. And we wanted to make a new informal public space that faced onto the road and um, for people accessing it from the King's Road and uh, to create a new sort of indoor outdoor connection to the park. So there would be a courtyard, the lodge courtyard, which faced onto the park with a cafe facing onto that. And then a whole series of um, informal but connected um, spaces. And the idea here was that the different spaces could um, act all as one. So one large community centre or as individual spaces that could be rented out. Um, so these diagrams that we prepared sort of an early stage just looked at 
how that might work. So at the top, you can sort of see the day-to-day -day use would be with an open cafe, an open kitchen, an open common room space and lobby, which allowed the connection free to the park with a hall space that's separately rentable. And then a series of different sort of rental models where all of the spaces could be used in conjunction with one another. Um, and sort of touching on the brick side of this conversation into planning, um, we went in with stone um, or terracotta as our sort of material of choice because the existing wall shown in this sort of visualization had terracotta in it. We were trying to pick up on that. Um, and I think at planning, to be, to be completely honest, we were sort of in between methods in which we would actually try and realize that it was only a one story building. So we were looking at stone, um, but that scene became sort of a little bit too expensive and too complex for just a one story building, we thought. Um, so that at that point, we were looking at alternatives and um, we met with Stone Cycling, who are a really interesting um, company who use um, recycled waste um, to form 70% of the brick matter. So only 30% is clay and then the rest is recycled waste. So on the left hand side was the, sort of, was the base product we were working with um, and we really enjoyed the fact that these bricks are the face of them is sliced off so you have this almost Toblerone like Toblerone like texture of them um, and we found that really fascinating so the material palette on the right shows our sort of first crack at what we wanted to try and achieve which was a which was this sort of Toblerone like stone like texture but with um, a white aggregate rather than a terracotta so this is actually our toilet um, old, old porcelain toilets that have been used for this um, and we went to the factory we went through a really sort of bespoke amazing process with, with them to try and get the brick to be what we wanted it to be um, the one which is sliced is much more expensive than the base brick and so we worked really hard at getting the base brick to have more texture and more interest to it and so on the right hand side you can see um, the brick that we got out in the end, which I think is really interesting sort of texturally and interesting to know that that is mostly recycled waste. Um, and they're now working actually to, to get more like 80 or 90% recycled waste in their bricks. Um, and in order to use the brick and to try and keep it as pure as possible, we actually had to, um, we had to make our own brick bonds to do that. Um, and we also did it because we, we wanted to use the brick. We were really keen on it because of its sustainability, but also its aesthetics. We actually ended up brick, flipping the brick on its side so that we got more brick per square meter. Um, and what that allowed us to do um, was to cut the costs by 30% of the brickwork and have a much higher specification. And luckily, I mean, this is only a, only a sort of um, single story building we can then just, we can still have that as a load bearing facade. So the, the brick is actually only 65 mil load bearing, which is really interesting. And so we created this new bond, which was a sort of third bond. So you started with the brick on its end and then set out from there. And we sort of feel like this made quite a lovely um, consistent brick surface, which was quite close to stone. Um, yeah, and then just running through a series of images of that. So approaching the building from the street it sort of has this feeling I think successful feeling of sort of lean to um, garden structures which was something we were really curious and interesting about and then this sense of the public space on entrance so um, at the moment it's not open obviously it's been using it used as a covered testing center but um, in due course you know the gates will be open and it'll be seen as a new entrance to the park um, and then this mixture of sort of high level, um, high level glazing, which um, has some louvers to um, deal with the overshading and um, all of the space is internally lit by this high level glazing. And these, I think the typology for us was really interesting. Um, greenhouse lean to structures often have big solid um, load bearing walls. And we wanted to make sure that these weren't too perforated with windows. So it's very much this idea of big high level glazing and then solid gable end walls. And there's the views from the street. 
And then just to pick up on um, the sort of second key sustainability point on this building was that we tried to do two to three key packages. So try and break the building down into three packages really. And that was the CLT frame, the glazing and the brickwork. And the integration of those three things was really key. So you can see from these structural models that actually the building is predominantly the frame. Um, there's not much more we need to add to it. We tried to cut down plasterboard and linings to an absolute minimum and just make a sort of shell of a space, which also flip fitted with the flexibility brief. Um, and then we worked through with Elliot Wood to try and thin down the structure as much as possible. So to try and make the building weigh as little and as we could. And that basically allowed us through all of that work to thin down the slab, which is the only sort of negative element in terms of using a large area of concrete. We managed to thin down the slab to 175 mil, which is really thin because the building doesn't weigh that much. And then I think just, just some illustrations there of, of how simple our approach really was in, in terms of putting all of our work as architects into the frame and into the drawing of the brickwork on the outside. There's not many steps between when the CLT is put up and the actual final finish um, and just trying to keep everything clean and, and um, detailed away from one another. So the glazing sits proud of the frame um, and then the green stain tries to sort of highlight the um, roof structure on this. And really key was the sort of flexibility between spaces. So this is the a view between the hall and the cafe space and then that view out to the courtyard at the end. And yeah, and then the final thing is, um, is this sort of illustration of how we thinned everything down. We did up until a stage have thick columns into the courtyard. We really tried to thin down the building to weigh as little as physically possible and ended up with these sort of 80 by 60 mil columns in the, in the courtyard side to try and thin down that. And that allowed us to have a really good sort of indoor outdoor connection. Um, and the brick really for us tied, tied into all of this brief and ended up with a really successful finish. Um, but it was really for a one story building. So working with stone cycling really allowed us to um, make something really bespoke. Um, and now they're starting to sort of scale up their operations and offering something much more commercially um, available and good um, and cheaper, um, which is really interesting. But it was lovely working with a brick manufacturer to produce something that was both aesthetically beautiful and also sustainably great. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Michael, for your insight. Next up, I'd like to welcome Will Gamble, Director of Will Gamble Architects. Thank you very much. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Uh, you can all see that now. Um, uh, firstly, thank you very much for inviting me to talk today. Um, today, I'm going to talk to you about one of our uh, first significant projects um, called, called the Parchment Works. Um, I'll talk about the project as a whole first, and then I will go into a little bit more detail about the specification of the brick and stone walls uh, and the necessary steps we took in order to sensitively preserve um, these historic structures. Um, the project itself is, is based in, in, in rural Northamptonshire, um, on the border of Rutland and Leicestershire. Um, it's a grade two listed um, cottage with ancillary, ancillary outbuildings. Um, the property is broken down into three main parts. There's a um, Victorian cottage, which you can see just in the background here, which addresses the high street that runs sort of left to right on this image um, and tucked behind this. Uh, white gate. Beyond the cottage there is a, an old cattle shed and you can just make out, make out the gable end of that cattle shed here. And then in the forefront of this image is uh, the ruin walls of a former parchment um, paper making factory. Um, the latter 
uh, was rumoured to make uh, parchment paper for the royal family, although uh, we never found any historical evidence to justify this claim, and we suspect it's probably an old wives' tale, but uh, a beautiful old wives' tale um, at that. But in any event, um, the building itself carried with it huge historical significance, both in its listing as a great two building, and also um, what we discovered, its status amongst the, the local community, not just in the village, but um, in, the sur in the surrounding villages and towns. Um, so it was a huge um, honor to be given the opportunity to uh, uh, breathe new life into what was, when we, when we first arrived on the site, uh, quite a dilapidated uh, looking um, structure. Um, initially, the client's brief was to um, convert the cattle shed, which, it, which you can see here, into habitable accommodation um, and connect the Victorian cottage and the cattle shed, but demolish the ruin walls um, and instead place an extension over the footprint of the parchment paper factory. Um, for some reason, and I think it's probably because the client had lived with these ruin walls for some time now, they viewed them as a bit of a constraint and, uh, and were determined to get rid of them. Um, and the principle of dem demolishing these, the, these historic structures goes against the ethos of our practice. Certainly, we like to, we've, we, well, we believe that reuse is the most sustainable form of architecture. So uh, we began a dialogue with trying to convince our client um that restoring the the masonry walls of the parchment paper factory was the only real way forward um eventually they got on board and this became the the driving principle behind the, the entire scheme which was about preservation through sustainable um reuse um the concept of retaining the historic walls was achieved through the idea of inserting a contemporary structure within the confines of the ruined walls, as illustrated by this rather crude massing study that we did from the very beginning of the design process. Um, and the first step uh, to understand whether or not this, the ruined walls were suitable for this kind of conversion was to undertake a structural survey to ascertain um, the condition of these walls. Um, the survey was came back relatively positive. The foundations were actually deeper than what we'd hoped, and the walls were in in, in relatively good condition. Um, as such, um, the engineer, uh, as such, we had to find a solution um, where we could work around these ruin walls. But even though the ruin walls were in in good condition, the engineer was reluctant to um, put any additional load through these. So we had to come up with a concept where. Essentially, there was a building within a building. Um, and that was achieved quite simply, really, by casting a strip foundation around the perimeter of the room walls to a depth that did not undermine, undermine the room wall, and then simply building a single single kind of block work off the, off the footing to create the primary, the primary structure. Um, above ground, it was a slightly more complex scenario. Unfortunately, the ruin had suffered from ivy overgrowing the structure and the roots penetrating the, the brickwork. It also, parts of it also suffered from persistent prevailing winds. And as a result, some of the masonry was defective. Um, in total, we had to remove between 10 and 15% of the defective masonry and replace it with, with, with masonry to match. Um, fortunately, um, the site had piles of, of rubble on it um, that was a remnant of smaller satellite buildings that had been previously demolished. And the stone and brickwork found in those piles of rubble was an exact match to what was on the ruin. Um, and this meant that we could carefully ensure and that the, that the stonemasons were replacing like for like brick for brick, stone for stone. And this was watched by the council's archeologist during the entire process as a condition of the, of the planning application. Um, 
once the defective masonry was removed, we then had to uh, rake out all the old lime mortar and replace it with a lime mix that matched the existing, but also gave us the textural quality that we were after. We wanted to go for a coarse lime to ensure to, to marry with the rugged idiosyncratic nature of the, of the ruin walls themselves. Um, uh, and you can see an image of the, the lime pointing here. Um, we decided to go for what's known as a flush joint to the, to the masonry, um, the flush pointing joint, and that's achieved by um, raking out the, the old mortar, applying a heavy, heavy, heavy um, application of the lime over the stone face, and then using a wire brush to brush back the excess um, and create create the flush joint and the wiring or the brushing back process also brings out the aggregate in the in the mortar to give us that rough texture we're after. Um, this image on the left hand side actually sort of demonstrates that that process perfectly here the stonemason was working on the old chimney to the parchment, parchment factory. Um, on the left hand side you can see how he's um, raked out the old mortar, he's then applied the, the lime heavily to the front face of the stonework. And then here on the right hand side, you can see how he's uh, completed the final stage by uh, removing the excess uh, uh, and creating the, the, the flush, flush pointing. And that was the final result after about two months working on the, uh, on the ruined walls. The, um, Obviously, the ruined walls were the main event of, 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 of this project, and we wanted the concept of, ex, of uh, celebrating and, and exposing these ruined walls to, to, to flow through into the, into, into the interior spaces. Um, so the idea of, uh, of exposing the structure was, was, was just as important outside as, as, it, as it was was inside. And we tried to minimize the amount of plasterboard um, that we used inside as much as possible in order to achieve this. Um, and this didn't just apply to the, the masonry walls themselves, it also applied to the roof structure. As you can see, um, we exposed all the steel work and, and the timber joists. Um, internally, what we did slightly different to the, to, to the masonry walls um, was specify three, three layers of lime wash um, to be, run, to run, to be um, applied to the stone surface to create um, a beautiful mottled chalky effect. Um, and what that product does also is it penetrates deep into the stonework um, to provide a layer of protection from the everyday life of using a space like this, whilst also allowing the stonework to breathe, which is really important when working with historic buildings um, like this one. Um, Exposing the ruined walls internally did come with its challenges. Um, like most historic buildings, um, the walls splayed or corbelled as they, as they reached the ground. Um, so we had to specify a solution to enable us to create neat finishes where our floor ran into the stonework. Um, so we came up with the idea of a monolithic skirting cast out of concrete that ran around the perimeter of the building, which you can see right here. And that allowed us to take our whitewashed oak floorboards right up to the walls in a neat and tidy fashion. This idea of conservation um, and celebrating the room walls um, was such a key design principle behind the entire scheme. And we wanted to make sure that you could experience the room walls from inside the space um, by framing views through the ruin and then onto the garden beyond. And I think this image demonstrates um, what we were hoping to achieve uh, quite successfully. Um, obviously the ruin walls were, the, were, the, were our primary concern throughout the project, but we wanted to make sure that we specified materials alongside um, these ruin walls that complemented the ruin walls um, and we were also, <coughs> sorry, that was my dog. <laughs> we were also um, 
uh, appointed to design a spoke um, kitchen for the client, which is something that we love to get involved in. And that gave us the opportunity, opportunity to have a full, full control over the overall aesthetic of the project. And here we went for a contemporary looking kitchen with clean lines um, that juxtaposed the sort of idiosyncratic nature or the rough nature of the room walls. So they could sit alongside one another and not compete with one another. And the concept of specifying materials that complemented the room walls also continued throughout into the exterior, um, where we specified Corten steel shells to run across the floor to height, the floor to ceiling glazing, um, which was a little nod to the site's industrial past as a, a parchment um, paper factory. And on the right hand side of the slide, you can see these shells being fabricated by a local metal worker and then left in the yard for three months to develop the natural rusty patina uh, before being lifted on site and suspended off galvanized steel brackets. Um, we even went to the length of ensuring that the weld joints to the court end steel shells lined through with the glazing bars below. Um, and that's us. I just, and that's yeah, that's us finished. And I think that just to hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight into what we do and how and how we like to how we like to work. Great, thank you very much, Will, for sharing that project. Now I'd like to welcome Alice Brownfield, Associate Director at Peter Barber Architects. Hi there. Um, yeah, well, incredibly interesting project. So it's a tough act to follow both of those, but um, I'll share my screen and we'll get started. Um, thank you very much for having me along. Can everyone see, can you see my full screen? Yeah, great. So um, I am going to talk uh, briefly about um, some uh, housing project called Ordnance Road, which is a social rented housing project for the London Borough of Enfield. Um, and we were asked by the London Borough of Enfield to, um, to work on a number of infill sites across the borough. Um, some of them are shown here, some of them are sort of larger, like the one on the left, which is about 150 units and some of them much smaller. They'd identified a range of sites that needed um, that, that could be used for future provision of social rented units. And so this is this forms one of them. And one of the main challenges of the project was the um, low budget for it. The project itself is based up in uh, the north of Enfield, up near Enfield Lock by this red dot up here. Um, it's on a site which fronts a main road called Ordnance Road, which runs east-west here. And this is the site in the middle. It's surrounded by um, lots of sort of two-storey um, semi-detached houses um, and some terraces, along with some other tower blocks. Uh, and it was current, it was when we came to it, it had a temporary sort of set of demountables, which were forming a community library, which was going to be moved elsewhere to a permanent home. So uh, the approach to the site was to, first of all, um, make a, a hard edge to that, to that main road and also to think about how we could improve the boundary to these houses to the south. Um, so the project introduced a, a series of 11 townhouses, which are three bed houses, three storeys, fronting Ordnance Road, which is this road uh, east-west here, with a series of smaller cottages, single storey cottages to the rear. Um, which provided um, wheel, not only wheelchair accessible units, but some um, sort of mid accessible units. Um, and what that did is also provide a frontage to this back so that these, uh, this boundary for these homes wasn't quite as vulnerable as before and that this space becomes, in, in a sense, a new street, a new new street. This is one of the earlier sketches that we did in the office, um, just showing the massing of these row of townhouses along the front and these smaller houses to the rear. Originally, the smaller houses to the rear were taller, they were two storeys. We had to reduce that because from discussions with the planners and the sense of um, sort of overlooking of these buildings here. And so what we've tried to do in the detailing of them and the way that we've used brick for this project is to keep some height onto this muse um, so that the, the muse feels well overlooked and they have a kind of presence, a strong presence onto the street. Each townhouse has a arch at the front um, and that is just a single storey arch which allows the building to step back a little bit further from the pavement. It's quite a busy road and it just gives a sort of space which feels a little bit um, 
kind of shrouded a little bit private and what's really nice about going back there now is that people are putting wellies and prams and just leaving them in the front which is lovely and then with these units here um, you can see a slight sort of dotted line here where we lift the roof up and use a brick detail for the window to create a, a strong presence onto this new Muse Street to the south. These are some elevations to show you that sort of rhythm of those arches coming along and also on the Muse to the rear where we start popping up uh, the windows. The buildings, the, the townhouses which front onto Ordnance Road itself slope backwards so that they minimise too much impact on these new homes here, um, but they have these pop-up windows which again creates a sense of you know, an active facade that it's not a rear, it's a new street that we're forming here. And we've used little flurries, um, like sort of wavy roofs over the bin stores, so they don't feel sort of too uh, industrial. Um, this is the plan of the homes, uh, the typical townhouses, and you can see the arch in the front there, and we've just stepped back an inset terrace above the arch, which I will talk about a little bit more um, as we go forward. And these are the single storey cottages to the rear, which each have their own courtyard to the side. So the main outlook is sideways rather than into the mews, not only for the privacy of the homes which exist, but also the privacy of residents within these units too. And then they still have windows onto the street, but their primary outlook is into their private space. Um, so there's a number of brick details that we um, used on the scheme for, um, for sort of meet social ambitions of the scheme, but also to try to reduce costs. Um, so, and try to sort of create a high quality details, but without too much complexity. So on the front of uh, the project facing Ordnance Road, we have a series of traditionally built arches uh, and some very simple jarly walls, which you can see here in elevation. To the rear, we've got these little lovely wavy roofs above refuse stores and um, popping up the parapet, sort of stepping up the parapet here with projecting bricks around these windows to, to create that sense of presence over the street to the rear. And again, with the smaller cottage, one-story one cottages, they step up again and they have a wavy roof to give that interior space um, a sense of generosity. Um, that is slowly loading on my screen, but this is just some sections through the townhouse at the top and the single story house at the bottom. And you can see uh, here where we're sort of starting to step up parapets and have these projecting bricks, as well as the arch structure here and this um, arch ceiling for the single story buildings. The brick itself is a tumbled brick, um, which we've used on a couple of other projects. These two projects here, the, the top is a, a homeless training facility in Peckham, and the bottom two is a homeless hostel in Mount Pleasant in Camden. We've used this brick a lot because um, in, a way, in a way it's kind of the distressed genes of brick. It's um, chucked back in and mixed around so that it has a really soft edge and a, and a good sort of um, varied tone to it. So it works quite well to create um, a sort of a sense of softness to these elevations. Um, so the arches at Ordnance Road are just single story. They're traditionally built in masonry. Um, we tend to vary between how many headers we have, depending on the scale of the arch, which we've now done on quite a few projects. This is another project which had taller arches to it, which are um, obviously two stories and, and much thicker. But again, doing the same job. These are actually back of pavement houses here. So in a way, the arches are even more important to give that sense of semi-private space. Um, and with most of these arches, um, you, we, we're building them traditionally and in a load bearing fashion. Obviously, this isn't any, any, uh, anything new. We've been doing this for millennia. Um, but these arches here are, these are on a separate project, but these are 665 deep. So they're quite chunky in depth. Um, and the whole um, facade above is loaded onto the arch itself. On other projects, um, we would always encourage that approach whereby there isn't there's no need for steel above the arches on other projects we've lost that um we've lost that discussion and um for reasons really of critical paths and so this is an example of a project where we have had arches um built but there's been a steel a steel beam introduced above the arch which allows the project to proceed and then come back to producing these arches and, and they're very straightforward to construct. They're just plywood formers, um, which the brick is built up on top of. So this is the photo you can see, uh, one arch has been installed. All of the rest of the building has been built, but the new arches are still to come in over here. 
And this is the Ordnance Road Arch, just to give you a sense of, you know, what that's like. It's just solid, solid masonry. And in this instance, it isn't load bearing anything other than the brickwork in here, but it could take the loading above. It's just a setting out drawing that we provide for the plywood, um, the plywood uh, former, very straightforward. And at ground floor, this is the detail for the arches that we would use. Uh, typically, these have um, slightly chunky buttresses um, and um, normally a masonry in here to prevent them sort of splaying outwards. And then at first floor, we introduce a, a beam in here just to carry an inset terrace, which you can see in this photo here. Um, this isn't so much about the brick really, but um, very simply the way the um, arch ceilings are created is just by fixing a curved timber wall plate onto the wall and fixing the joists around accordingly and being able to then create this lovely profile to the roofs, which gives them a bit of um, joy and also generosity to the inside space. The projecting brick windows again are very, very straightforward. Um, Effectively, um, they are just trying to create a slightly deeper reveal onto the street and add some detail and variance to the elevations. And effectively, all they are is, is a brick on, it, on its side. Um, depending on how much loading is above, above the brick and how much is provided from the windows, um, depends on how much the structural engineer will let us cantilever these out. But um, if, if there's a concern about that, then we have introduced um, metal straps into here, which just kind of pin pin the brickwork every sort of 400 mil. And you can just see some of those windows in these photos. Quite a lot of our projects, we try to just soften the corners of them ever so slightly. And so um, this is done very simply just by having snapped headers on site. Um, this is a slightly wider curve, but um, you can see here that it's, it's a very simple thing to do. And we've been fortunate to work with a lot of Lots of brick workers who really are keen to, um, you know, who are incredibly talented and really keen to do stuff like this. Um, and we'll try and, and make the most of those corners by introducing things like oral windows to them as well. This is uh, a different project, but another social rent project for Barking and Dagenham. Um, and I just wanted to show this because when we're working on lots of projects where the budget is very low, we try to have a conversation with the client about the importance of a good quality brick. Um, often, you know, they might be replacing the kitchens or the flooring ever so often, but you would never replace the brick, obviously. And so we're trying to achieve kind of exciting, joyful details with relatively straightforward means of doing it. And, and none of this is at all innovative, um, but it's just to, to sort of reiterate how simple they are. There's the circular windows. Internally, we just create a an orthogonal opening in the blockwork behind. So there's an internal concrete lintel carrying the blockwork, but obviously um, the outside is, is entirely load bearing in itself. There's no need for a lintel for that. Um, and the windows pushed in from behind. These are our Afro windows, which are again, very straightforward in a similar fashion. There's just a concrete lintel internally. The, the masonry itself is just a row of headers in our normal construction uh, arched and the windows due to cost more than anything are square orthogonal and we just have an insulated board here with a preformed cavity tray at the top and all of our sort of weep holes are lined up above it. We've done a few of these on, on other projects which is slightly cheating in a way because they um, involve brick slips but um, this is just a sort of recessed um, window detail the jam of which is solid brick cut down on site uh, and the head and the sill of it are brick slips attached to cement particle board with weep holes in between. Um, I think I'm coming to the end of the sort of presentation, but this is just to show some of the other things that we've been doing. This is a little folly for kids, it's sort of called the tree house in one of our housing schemes in Peckham and um, just very simply trying to use a high quality brick to give a bit of variance to um, the textures in the project. Um, we also always try to have a light coloured mortar on our schemes and one of the main challenges of that is, is not only cost but also that um, often they aren't available in um, sort of pre-mixed batches onto site so you end up having them in smaller quantities and having to mix it on site which is challenging over larger scales and so on a couple of projects we have used a natural mortar 
for actually laying the bricks and then pointed them as something else. And I think this photo comes in quite useful for us when we're trying to explain to clients the, the importance of thinking about these things if there's room in the budget and finding ways around the tight budget that can still create this high quality image. Because to me, this looks like two different types of brick. And I thought I'd just leave it there. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alice, for that presentation. Um, and thank you again to all of you for your um, such useful and informative presentations, um, really nice contrast of projects. Um, we've already had lots of Q and A's from the audience, but I'd like to start by asking um, Alice first about um, about the projects at Peter Barber Architects. Um, and I know the brick, um, you talk about the importance of this, of the high quality brick, and obviously brick is very um, important aesthetically in the projects, but what do you think is more important when specifying brick sustainably? Do you think it's detailing well to ensure their longevity or specifying a really good quality brick or even a, a local or recycled brick? Um, I don't I don't know. I would I would be really interested to see data on what you know what makes how can we use brick in the most sustainable way i think there are there, there are many ways in which it can help it's obviously incredibly in, unsustainable in the sense that it's fired and it involves a huge heat process um i think one of the ways that we try to use brick uh, well masonry in general is to try to reduce steel work that goes in projects um and to I mean we've had so many schemes where we've had arches and the contractors come in and said well obviously that'll have to be a, an arch steel that's clad in brick slips and um you know it's just crazy to be doing stuff like that not only does it look you know pretty awful sometimes but um unless there's a unless there's a site constraint which means that you can't sort of access that to get in um and then I think if we're we're always looking for bricks that are manufactured in the UK to use I think that's a huge thing um, and it's really fantastic to see Michael's presentation about that, that stone cycle and um, we'd love to work with more people like that and, and hopefully hopefully as those projects become um, more widespread those products will become more commercially commercially available as well. Great thank you and um, moving on to Will um, Obviously, you talked about kind of um, you you kind of reused and reclaimed a lot of the bricks from the site. Do you feel that um, in order to do that in a project, do you do you as an architect have to be more flexible, especially when when it comes to working on site and working with what you have? Absolutely, um, I think you have to be more flexible when working with historic buildings anyway, because they always um, um, gift you surprises, um, whereas with a new build that necessarily doesn't happen. Um, but in 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 regards to the parchment works, yeah, it was it was a very flexible process. Um, fortunately, um, when we when we were able to upcycle the material um, from the from the piles of rubble found on site um, at the start of the design process, um, the client actually <laughs> took it upon themselves to sort through all those piles of rubble, so we knew exactly what we had in advance. So when it came back to doing the remediation work to the ruin, um, we knew what, what what material we had and and how we could then apply it to restore restore the structure. And Michael, um, going back to kind of stone cycling, um, can you talk a bit more about the time frame of working with them and um, how much the toing and froing there was in the collaboration? Yeah, I mean it was it was quite a long. I got I got a pamphlet of their bricks before we even started mm -hmm. on the project. And we sort of always knew that they would be really expensive, but basically called them up and had had a really good working process with them about trying to work out a way in which we could use their bricks on this project and how we could get it down to cost. So, I mean, we worked with them from sort of stage, the end of stage two, all the way through to the end of stage four. And we then, as soon as we started on site, we, we went and saw the bricks and we were part of the process really um, in the factory. And so I went over to the Netherlands and sort of, we walked through the process and they're a really interesting company because they use, so they use an existing brickwork, enough, they work, they sort of latch onto another existing brickwork manufacturer. Um, but yeah, we did sort of, 
we were really conscious about using a European brick, but we did look at it. And I mean, the difference with stone cycling is that they, their plant is, is powered from forest compensated gas. So it does have the actual firing of the brick has a lower embodied energy in it than we would be getting in the UK. And we also did lots of comparisons in terms of the waste that was being used in the bricks. And what was really interesting is how bad we are at recycling waste in the UK. The waste that was coming through was so dirty that we couldn't use, because they were using waste sources from the UK, from France, Belgium. We couldn't use any of the UK stuff because it wasn't clean enough and we were going for a pale brick. Um, and I guess most of the brick is also glass. So what's really interesting is, is that it's much better performing in terms of frost rating and um, sort of structurally than a normal brick. So we could use it all the way throughout. We could use it below, below ground and, and everywhere really. Um, but yeah, we just, we sort of, they're a really small startup or when we first started working with them really small. So they were really willing to sort of help us out. And there was a few hiccups on the way some bricks that didn't come at the right size and things. So there was a lot of sort of, you know, we had to reset out the building and things like that. But that's the sort of joy you get with working with really sort of young manufacturers. And it was a really great process. And, you know, we said to them that we didn't like the brick, one of the bricks as they'd given it in the, in the sample. And they, they spent three months working on that. And that was actually the cheapest one. So the base brick, they worked really hard at. And it ended up being nicer than the really expensive ones. So we actually, the sort of cheaper parts of the building, the brickwork looks better than the expensive ones. But it's nice. Do you think you'll um, work with them again in the future? Yeah, I'd lo love to. I mean, there was a few, because they're a really small company, it was really, it was quite difficult to get them on the project. There was issues with warranties and things. And, and yeah, it was quite a struggle, but they're pushing themselves, they want to be zero carbon um, completely and they want to be using 100% recycled material in the, in the future. So I see a really, a really good, uh, they're a really good company to use. And also their, their plant is, it, it ships directly to the UK. So from plant to Southampton, it's shipped, which is much better in terms of transport. So then it's only 80 miles to London from Southampton. So it's actually, I think it's really important that as architects, we sort of don't just focus on the UK thing and look at the whole picture of the whole process behind the brick, because that's really, that's really important to actually get the bigger, the bigger picture and stuff, but I'd love to work with them again. Thanks. And um, going back to Will um, and looking at the kind of the, 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 the use of reclaimed bricks, do you think the industry as a whole is too quick to, kind of throw away what they deem as kind of unusable bricks? Uh, absolutely. Um, I think reuse is probably one of our watchwords as a practice. Um, and any opportunity we can reuse any building material, we'll, we'll, we'll jump at it. Um, but, you know, it does, it does, it does have its challenges. Um, for example, the bricks that we were reusing on the parts from works, um, because they were historic bricks, they were very soft. Um, and quite porous. Uh, um, so back to the specification of the lime water, we had to make sure that the lime water was as soft as a brick. Official, um, so that freeze for action wouldn't get into the into the soft bricks and blow the faces, um, which you probably. Okay, I'm gonna ask another question to you, Alice, because um, it looks like Will is frozen. Um, but um, can you talk a bit more about, um, about how you go about researching your brick and kind of and choosing them and kind of balancing them against cost? Yeah, I think, um, so I think we have, one of the, the main challenge on a lot of these projects is producing a high quality building with a very, very low budget. Um, and you know, ideally, um, local authorities would be given much more money to spend on housing. And you know, I mean, it's nonsensical that we have local authorities declaring climate emergencies and then having interest on their borrowing increased. And the first thing to go is going to be that focus on how we build buildings sustainably. Unfortunately, um, in terms of sort of um, 
researching the brick, uh, often what we will try to do is um, never give the name of the project <laughs> um, and try to understand roughly what those bricks might cost. Um, and then we will often try to work out a crude how many bricks we have in the project. And we will try to compare, you know, here's a lower quality brick, here's the higher quality brick in terms of its appearance and its performance. Um, there's a cost difference of this across the project. And often that's a very small percentage of the whole construction value. And so that's how we try to try to sort of reassure ourselves and the client, you know, and be responsible with public money. Um, and that, yeah, that's sort of our process really. And, and we're always trying to find um, locally sourced bricks that are within that price range. It's, it's just a challenge, um, but it's really fantastic to see, um, you know, the projects that the may are doing and, um, we've had a few projects now where um, we, we're sort of reusing existing buildings and retrofitting them. And so um, we're really keen, as Will is sort of saying, that, you know, first, the first point of call is what can we reuse? Great, thanks. OK, so I'm going to move on to some questions from the audience. Um, the first one we've had is about specifying non-concrete and lime mortars increasingly. So bricks can be... Um, recycled more easily. Um, I don't know who wants to ask this one, but are you all kind of looking into doing this more? Definitely. Um, well, we used to, because of obviously working with old buildings, lime is so important to allow the structure to breathe. And just, I don't know how much you heard about what I was saying previously, I think I cut out, but um, <laughs> When we were, yeah, when we were using the brick on the parchment works, it was very soft and very porous, um, and therefore we need to specify a lime mortar that was equally as soft and allowed the masonry to breathe, um, and also be sacrificial so that um, free for action wouldn't wouldn't um, destroy the face of the brickwork. So um, not only is lime more sustainable than cement-based products, it's also they're a great material to use and really, really flexible. So I'd encourage everyone to use it as much as they possibly can. It comes down to time though, like on bigger projects, we just get the issue of time. It is slightly more expensive, mm. but it's, it's always a cost mm. item. But, you know, it was really interesting seeing Alice's projects, how even they didn't have, they couldn't give the time to build the brick arch first. So that gives a good indication of, of how much time pressure there is on, on lime mortar and how long yeah. it takes to dry on larger projects. That's, that's always the issue we're facing. Um, the cost thing you can justify, but the time is, is harder, really. Great, thanks. And I've had a question through, um, aimed at you, Alice, about um, whether the, um, obviously um, a lot of the schemes that you work on feature these amazing arches and circular windows. Um, how, how has the um, response from the planners been on the majority of these projects? Uh, yeah, I, th I mean, we tend to have quite successful relationships with planners, and um, I think possibly because we are achieving, I mean, these are small schemes I presented today, mm -hmm. um, but the principles apply to our much larger schemes as well, that we are trying to achieve a high density with a low rise, low or mid rise typology, you know, sort of up to six stories tall. And um, often that's as sort of broader uh, urban consideration that's well received because um we're talking about everyone having front doors onto the street etc um and often achieving densities that are slightly higher than, than we might do if we had a similar scale flatted block that was perhaps one or two stories taller simply because there's no communal circulation and, and calls and all of that stuff so in a way i think a lot of our projects feel quite cottagey and actually that's quite reassuring to planners in who are working in more suburban boroughs um, and I think probably the softness of those details helps a little bit um, because they have a sort of more arts and crafty sense to them um, yeah we do we do come across some resistance sometimes um, and I think it's about working out what's suitable for the local area and making sure we kind of keep that keep the new streets for creating activated and um, Michael um you've discussed already about how um, you kind of look further afield in the UK when it comes to brick specification. Has um, Brexit had an impact on your brick supply on any of your projects you've worked on? Um, 
I don't know that it necessarily has to date. Um, I think I think one of I mean, some of the issues do go with tr like brick trends as well, and like certain bricks, certain brick colours and types you don't typically get in the UK. So you know, lighter brick, you know, white bricks often come from a specific period place on the Dutch German border, and that's where we're getting samples from. And so that is always an issue, I think. And so that's why we sort of look, we do look further afield in, in terms of trying to get things that match into certain contexts. I mean, for Sands End, it what we were trying to match into a terracotta brick. So so we couldn't, you know, that terracotta firing process doesn't happen anymore. So we had to try and get something that tonally would be right. And we couldn't get that really in the UK unless we used stone or, or concrete. So that's why we ended up going to Holland really. Um, so that is, yeah. I think either there has to be a full shift in what people expect in terms of brick tone and that has to be more locally based. Or if we want to still achieve these sort of tones and colours, we have to find ways, sustainable ways to get them from the continent. I've had a quite a technical question through for Will. Um, where, where your bricks were left exposed internally, how thick are those external walls? The external walls, they're about 600 mil. Uh, thick. They were chunky, chunky walls, yeah. Monolithic. Yeah, very monolithic. Are you um are you using um reclaimed brick on any projects on at the moment? Um well I mean a lot of stuff that we do in London, um we use reclaimed London stock bricks all the time to get an exact match. Um so um it's a it's a common theme throughout all our projects to be honest. Um, and it's something we like to do as much as we possibly can. Um, as I said, like re reuse is such an important part of what we do. Um, and we strongly believe that it is the most sustainable form of architecture, um, reuse and retrofitting old buildings. Um, so, yeah. Great. Um, so it looks like that's it on the, on the um, questions through from the audience. Um, so um, yeah, thank you again for such a um, informative discussion. It was really interesting and all the projects was a um, really nice contrast. Um, and I'd um, like to have a, um, a huge thank you to you for taking part today and to all those who joined and for your questions. Um, and thanks again to all our supporters, um, Mikkel Mersch and Van der Sanden for making this event possible. Um, we hope to see you all next time. Thank you. Um, thanks, thanks. Thank you.